Welcome to Pemberton Hall. My name is Bill Wilson and I'm going to be taking you on a tour today. Uh, Pemberton Hall was built in 1741 by Isaac and Ann Handy. However, they had been living here about 18 years before Pemberton Hall was built. They bought the plantation in 1726. And it was about a thousand acres. Isaac had been raised by his older brother in Bermuda. His father and mother, um, his father particularly, came as an indentured servant to Somerset County in the 18th century. Somerset County was what is now Worcester County, Wicomico County, 30 miles up into Delaware, and all of present-day Somerset County. So it included everything from the ocean to the bay. So it was a large piece of land. Three of his brothers had already uh, had plantations started here on the Wicomico River, so he joined them here. His father had come as, a, as an indentured servant in the 1670s to Somerset County and uh, without even owning the shirt on his back. But before he died, he was very wealthy, owning ships, uh, owning several thousand acres. And there are two ways that you do that in the 18th century. Um, one is through land ownership, and the second one is marrying well. So keep that in mind as we do our tour through the house. Now the setting for this house. This was a major construction for the time period, and he, it took him about 18 years to acquire the capital to be able to do it, moving up in society. So it's a reflection of his wealth and status in society. There was an Indian town called Tundo Tank directly opposite on the other bank when he first came here. His first house was uh, about 16 by 20, and uh, Anne and Isaac raised eight children. By the way, she gave birth uh, every two years for 22 years, so they had 11 children. So will you join us inside now, please? You join us in the great room or hall. Pemberton Hall was built as a hall and parlor house. With one exception, it was built as, as an innovation with three rooms downstairs. We'll talk about upstairs a little bit later on with you, but you're in the great room at this point that is twice the size of what Isaac Handy's first house was, and also about twice the size of what 90 to 95 percent of the people of the Chesapeake Bay were living in at the time period. So this was a major room for the time period and the location on the lower eastern shore of Maryland. There are four things in here that would tell you of Isaac's wealth and comparison with your wealth or with your status in the community. And this was designed to show off his status. The second thing that would indicate his wealth and status in the community is paint color, which is Prussian blue, as you see around it. All the colors in the house have been returned to their original hue based on spectral analysis and microchemical analysis. This is the first patent paint color. It would have been extremely expensive. Uh, keep in mind that the people that are coming here on business or uh, to settle between court sessions for being held over for bond for the court session, for example, would have been living in something that if the, at the uh, most would have been whitewashed. So the paint color in here is meant to impress. The third thing is the furnishings. What you see in the room currently is what was here at Isaac's death in 1762. For example, chairs, there were 18 of these leather bottom chairs in the room. There were two tables, two looking glasses or mirrors, and 12 pictures on the wall which we have put back. So what you see here, even though to our mind today looks fairly sparsely furnished, was highly furnished in the 18th century. There are no rugs, there are no timepieces in any of the five inventories that we have. The equipage, for example, here on the table for him to be able to serve tea. We know that this was what was in the room because it's listed in his, prior, in his probate inventory taken at his death in 1762. The doors and windows, you notice, are opposite each other. Uh, that's so that they could be opened and the breezes in the summer could be captured. Uh, they see the, the large fireplace, which would have warmed the room in the 18th century, or at least tried to warm the room in the 18th century. But if the doors and windows are sitting open, you've got birds flying through, you've got chicken trotting through every once in a while, you're not going to waste money on highly expensive textiles and by the way, no neighbors, so you didn't have to worry about privacy. 
Fourth thing that would indicate his wealth and status in the community is display of wealth in the Beaufort. And that's how it's listed in the 18th century. A parcel of Cheney ware and glassware in the Beaufort. Also, his books would have been on display because they were fairly uncommon in the area. It was to indicate that he could read and write. There are two that are named by name. One of them is the Family Bible, and the second one is this book on the tea table presently, which is A Country Justice. And this was the manual of what to do between court sessions. He was a colonel in the militia. He was a justice of the peace, which is kind of like a sitting judge and county councilman all wrote into one. And between court sessions, he is probably working with his neighbors, settling disputes, holding people over with surety bond, and this was his manual of what to do when. If you also notice, the room is set for tea. And that tea equipage also indicated his status and wealth. If you had the time to sit down and take tea, then it indicated that you had the wealth to be able to afford to do it. That would have been on display in the great room Beaufort uh, between um, the time that it was set for tea and when it wasn't. And you also notice the, all the chairs and tables are back against the wall. This table and the large table that you see in the room, the other two tables that are in the room, would have been folded up, they are what we call today drop leaf tables, and put back against the wall. The room would have been straightened, and that's where that term comes from from the 18th century, meaning that you would be able to walk through the room uh, when there was no candlelight. On the wall over here are 12 pictures. They capture uh, a moral tale of the rise in society through hard work and industry, which is the theme for this room. Thanks for joining us in the bedchamber. We furnished this room as a bedchamber because we really don't know its specific use in the 18th century. But rooms were not designated as we do today. So it may have had multiple uses, including as a bedchamber. It wouldn't have been out of place, for example, for a bed to have been in here, even though that you walk through this room to get to the kitchen. Privacy was not an issue in the 18th century. It wasn't even a consideration until the latter part of the 18th century. You notice that his clothing is out, but it would have been folded and kept in the closets that you see above the fireplace here or in chests. Uh, families did not have a lot of clothing. Uh, Mr. Haney, even though he was wealthy, may have only had two or three sets of clothing. And children, for example, would be having much less. Uh, it is not the consumer goods available that we have today. These would have had to have been made specifically for their use. The bed is a roped bed and it is held in tension by the ropes. If you didn't tighten these ropes uh, occasionally, you end up uh, sleeping on the floor. It also has on it a mat, which is a big sack of a straw, and on top of that is a feather tick. Now, if you were uh, giving a gift to a daughter that's getting married or uh, leaving in your will, as Isaac did, to his oldest daughter, you would often give them your best feather tick. Now, the reason why is that it's one of the most expensive things in the house. It took years to fill them. The chamber pot that you here see here at my feet is their sanitation facilities. Uh, these would have been available for you in each room, as you saw in the parlor, for example. And we know that there were four of these in this house. Uh, these would have been utilized at night. And basically, opening the window and tossing the contents was not uncommon. Uh, you notice here on the table that it is set for Mr. Handy's dressing. Uh, there is a basin there for him to wash his face and hands in the morning when he gets up. Uh, the fire would have long been put out or gone out. Uh, it usually would have been curfewed at night because you couldn't take a chance on burning your house down. So it would be very cold in here. This is the north side of the house. You notice it's insulated from the south side of the house by this door. So it's easy to heat that other room 
This room would have been very cold in the morning to get up, and it wouldn't have been uncommon for you to have to crack the ice in that wash basin to wash your face and hands. Bathing was an optional thing in the 18th century. It was not considered to be a necessity, and the reason why is because they thought that if you washed off the oils that were on your skin, that's what caused you to get ill. Welcome to the kitchen. This kitchen was added on in 1787 or 1786 by Isaac's son, um, Henry, and Henry received the plantation at Isaac's death. Uh, it became fashionable to add your kitchen to the main body of the house about that time period. The original kitchen would have been an attached building that you would have used for uh, preparing meals, and the meals would have been brought across this courtyard and into the door that you just came down through. Above the doorway, you're going to notice a date brick with 1741 on it, which is inscribed into the brick, and that was put in place at the time that the house was finished. The furnishings of this room are very eclectic. Keep in mind that your main meal of the day would have been eaten about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, very leisurely, and dinner, uh, it would be called dinner, and supper would have been eaten about 9 o'clock at night, and it would have been what's left over from dinner. Now, in the morning, your breakfast would be served very early, and it would utilize waffles and so forth prepared here in the fireplace. Uh, the fire in this room would never have been allowed to go out. It's the only fire in the house that that was the case with. In the summer, it would be about 110 to 115 degrees in here. Uh, the doors and windows in here, you notice, are also opposite. So the exterior doors would have been sitting open in the summer, and flies and so forth would be coming in. So as you're preparing the meals for the day, starting in the early morning. As you finish them, you're going to be covering them and sitting them here on this table. I have at my hand, at my tip in my hand right now, um, a cattle horn. And this is indicative of the kind of thing that they would have utilized in the 18th century. This is the 18th century plastic. Uh, if you dip this in boiling water, for example, it becomes very flexible. And that flexibility then, you can take a pair of shears and open this up and produce a sheet of horn that can be utilized for a lot of purposes. One of the things in Isaac's inventory, as you see hanging here at the fireplace, is a lantern. In the 18th century, they're called land horns because instead of glass, which is breakable, they're using sheets of horn. So they're not really wasting anything from the same animal that produced this 18th century plastic, for example, which had dozens of uses, including, for example, for combs and, as everyone knows, the powder horn. From that same animal, you would receive tallow. When the animals were slaughtered in the fall, that tallow would be boiled down, and that's what the candles would be made of. Uh, light was a commodity in the 18th century. We think of nothing of tonight, for example, going home and flipping on the lights and having a bright room everywhere we go. And in the 18th century, that wasn't true. As I said earlier, there are only four candlesticks in the whole house in Isaac's time, and those would have been taken from one room to another. At any given time, you might have one candle going, which would give you enough to be able to see, for example, um, a group around where I'm standing, but over there in the corners of the room would be in deep, dense dark. Uh, the fireplace would have given you some light as well. You've joined us in the parlor. Uh, as I said earlier, this was a hall and parlor house, meant as a three-room house, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. This is the private space of the house. It wouldn't have been out of place, for example, for a bed to have been in here. This is where, during the day, for example, the family would have gathered. This is the place where uh, business would have been transacted uh, during the day. 
uh, Mrs. Handy would have been controlling what was going on within the uh, confines of the house and so forth from this room. But in the evenings, this is where the family would have gathered. It is a small space and it can be easily heated. And if you notice, the great room fireplace is much larger than the one in this room. Now, originally, there was a fireplace that was about a foot and a half larger than this in this room. And somewhere around 1750, renovations were done to the house. The great room fireplace received its first infill, and this room received a fireplace much smaller, and candid walls, small firebox, adds up to more warmth. The paint color in this room is called Spanish Brown, and Spanish Brown is the ubiquitous paint color for the time period. It was used on everything, including painting roofs, and it's an inexpensive paint based on uh, well, iron rust. Uh, this has two high gloss glaze layers placed over it, so it upgraded it slightly, uh, and it would reflect the light in the room, and by candlelight or by firelight, or even by moonlight, you would have been able to see at least a semblance of what we would be able to today in a modern room. Uh, at night, for example, you would have been seated near the window. Uh, very few candles would have been in existence. Uh, Mr. Handy, for example, only owned four candlesticks in the whole house. And remember, he's up for 5% of wealth in Somerset County. The room is solar heated as well. This house, for example, was built ecologically. He placed it so that it caught the prevailing breezes, which are from the northwest. So it's slightly tilted towards the northwest. The windows and doors are all opposite, high ceilings, and large windows, as opposed to, for example, in New England, where you have small openings and low ceilings. And the purpose of that is to be able to use the natural environment to help heat and cool the house. Uh, this room, for example, would have received in the winter uh, sunshine all day long. The room is set as if Mr. Handy, for example, had friends in for cards last night. Again, all the furniture in this room would have been placed back against the wall or straightened. The furniture in here is much more eclectic. And again, furniture is usually very fluid. It's transported from one place to another as it's needed rather than the way we do today. The furniture in here would have included flag bottom chairs, and we know that there were 10 flag bottom chairs and well, in addition to the 12 leather bottom chairs, and these flag bottoms would have been locally produced. And we have one example here. This is one of the pieces of furniture that we know was in the Handy family and may have been in this house. Flagging is cattail right out of the swamp down here, dried and twisted into rope and used for the seating. So this was a very much more relaxed room and less formal than the other room that you were in. What you see behind me is the 18th century milk house. This, however, is a reconstruction based on the archaeology and the documents that we have and is very thoroughly researched. It would have been built by Isaac's son, Henry, uh, in the latter part of the 18th century. If you notice, the exterior is composed of sawn logs with dovetailed or compound dovetailed corners. As you go inside, you're going to notice on the shelves large pans which would have contained uh, the milk products from the plantation cows. The milkmaid that would have been in charge of this building would have kept this spotless interior. Ultimately, however, this was Mrs. Handy's domain. I guess the best analogy is that this would have been the 18th century refrigerator. Uh, the reproduction objects that you see in the interior would have been the kinds of things that would have been contained within this milk house and show up in the 18th century inventory. And if you notice, we're looking at the exterior of the house. And if you were to draw a line between the top of the chimneys on either side and the base of the steps so that you formed an equilateral triangle, you notice that this house is based on geometry. Uh, everything that you see is balanced by something else. This is right at the beginning of Georgian symmetry. 
You notice underneath the eaves is what's called a plaster cove cornice. And the purpose of this was to draw air up from the ground, cool air up from the ground, past the windows, and out underneath the eaves. This is usually a feature of, house, of buildings and houses that are public spaces. The exterior of the house on the river side, and we're standing on the front of the house, which faced the river, you notice that it has a checkerboard quality of glazed header bricks that were the bricks closest to the firing. And this is a decorative feature that when new would have reflected the sunlight and you would have been able to see it well out river. Uh, it is a indication of his wealth. The exterior of this house, if you notice, is a um, fairly small by today's standards. It's about 2,500 square feet, but for the time period in which this structure was built in the 1740s, when there were only 250,000 people in the whole of Chesapeake, that's Maryland and, and uh, Virginia, this was a major construction for the time period and for the place in which it was constructed. Mr. Handy was uh, living in something was much smaller than this when he originally bought the plantation. We're now standing west of the house and you notice behind the uh, fence line of rails and these are uh, called snake fences or worm fences in the 18th century. The saying went with this that horse high or and hog tight. It also, when you were in your cups in the 18th century, you were said to be doing Virginia fences, which is another name for this fence line. All the fence lines here on the plantation have been put back in their original location, albeit that they went a mile and a half uh, to the north of where we're standing. And based on an 18th century document that we have, you also notice in the background the original orchard, or a portion thereof, because there were hundreds of trees, and it came up to approximately where we're standing at this point. Mr. Handy had a distillery operation going here on the plantation. He left his still to his oldest son when he gave half his plantation to that son, George, in 1750. To the uh, south of where we're standing is the Wicomico River. And that was the transportation hub of the 18th century. Uh, roads were crude and not very much usable at certain times of the year. And it was very dangerous, for example, to, to, uh, to travel these roadways or cart paths uh, because the hogs were allowed to run free. And uh, at that point also were black bears and wolves in the woods. You also notice to the uh, west of where I'm standing, uh, the location of the original 18th century wharf. It is the oldest documented wharf of its kind in the United States by dendrochronology or tree ring dating. Uh, underwater archaeology was done. It's 200 feet long. It's under the mud or anaerobic at this point so that it will not rot. And it was laid down in the uh, spring of 1746. Uh, the timbers were cut in the uh, winter of 1740. Five. Uh, leading to that is the original rolling road, which went about a mile and a half uh, to the uh, north of where we're standing. Crooked Oak Lane, the present day Crooked Oak Lane, is a site of that original rolling road, which went to the head of Isaac Handy's plantation. The Pemberton Hall Foundation wishes to thank you for joining us today and for your generous financial support. And we hope you will come back to see us again.